Well, we so. sat, you guys sat here five weeks ago and said that it's over, period. Sure, but, man. but here we are. I mean, you you said they're going to come back, right? Yeah, I did. I've I never, knew that. I, I knew never that. Got, I never got off the bandwagon one time, and you jumped off so fast. Your memory, it made your, it made your, your head spin. Your memory you is. You can't even remember where you parked your car. So you don't start with me. We ought to okay? take this god darn show. We'd find out <laughs> you know, what what you said and what you didn't say. You've been using that weak routine of yours for about three hundred years. That's a good thing. This is a joke. It's a good thing you knew it, because the manager didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you tell Gardy? I was going to mention it to him. And the general manager didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is a few... And some of the players didn't. Let me know when you're done. I'm this done. Is <laughs> I think most people know the voices. Dark Star was in there. Maxi, Sid, and our next guest, Patrick Royce, kind enough to join us. As uh, as well, I assume it is true, sir, that the stuff that was left on the during the commercials or on the cutting room floor from the sports show would probably be even more riveting than the uh, <laughs> actual TV show itself. Correct? Oh, oh, they be, between breaks when Dark and Sid let their entire animosity for one another <laughs> leak out. It was uh, it was always intriguing. <laughs> They had the advantage of doing a show together when they really couldn't stand each other, you know. (laughs) There was about six days a year when Dark and Sid got along, and the rest of the time, you know, because Sid, Dark would not bow to Sid's, uh, you know, uh, omnipotent status in the Twin Cities, and and that drove Sid nuts. Which meant... And you know what what was the kicker? What's that? When, When... when Darkie showed up at the front table with Knoblock when he signed. That's remember right. When he, remember when Knoblock yes. invited him up there for the sign? That was the end for Sydney. Yeah, I forgot night. about that one. That's, a, that's yeah. a classic. You and I, I think, had kind of the same reaction to the news yesterday. You mentioned, you know, that it, it's a testament that, to Sid that the man's 100 years old and you're still shocked that there's yeah. an announcement that he's passed away. I, I, I came at it similarly, just said the, uh, the old world, according to Garp, book uh, by Irving in which he says we're all terminal cases and that Sid was the one guy that had me questioning the premise. I mean, that's the, I guess, the irony of this thing, or maybe the, the proof of, of of how dominant he was is we were still surprised that it happened. Yeah, and, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, after you left us on full-time radio, and I, I kind of did some of that myself, what we, he became as he became even more insecure. He would not take a day off. He would not take a week off anymore. I mean, it was, it was amazing how much he needed it and, uh, how much he needed to be in that paper three, four days a week. And it's, it's kind of a interesting psychological, uh, mm. mystery that I would never be able to solve. No. His, his need for it was unbelievable. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, um, that he was still still going. I did have one last chance to tell him, and uh, I, I did to talk to him during the pandemic, and I said, Sid, the pandemic has made you even more of a homer. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> he never wrote a pandemic column that wasn't a complete kiss up the sub team in town. It was, he was... He was sent to the utter finish, I'll say that. Do you remember uh, when, back in the day where early Sunday columns were a thing, and if we weren't writing on deadline, there was hope that we would submit them Friday yeah. night in order to get the outstate edition out? And so the bit would be that Sid would come in Saturday, what, noonish, and the first thing he would have uh, done, he would, he would order, is that somebody, uh, some minion, would have to print your column if it was already in and or my column if it was already in so that he knew exactly what we'd written and he could either rebut it in his own <laughs> Sunday column or if it was a feature column, write like nine paragraphs about that individual as well. You remember that? Oh, yeah, it was unbelievable. I did love the ones where he cut you off at the pass. Yes, you know, yes. That's you, that's the one you break, you know, and I used to always tell him, don't give that bleeping bleeper 
a copy of the column when he came in. Whoever was in there, I said, don't let him see it. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Get it in. Yeah, he was unbelievable. Well, how about, and how about McEnroe and Eisen when they were doing investigative stuff? Oh, yeah. They had yeah. to hide in another part of the building that, <laughs> that secret cubbyhole of theirs because they knew if it was, a, if, especially if it was a gopher related deal, if Sid found out about it, the cat was going to be out of the bag. So they had to, they had to suppress it. From him, from a teammate who works for the same newspaper. Yeah, I've uh, I've tried to figure out that aspect of him. I actually talked to him when I wrote a thing about him on his 100th birthday, which was smaller than kiss up than this was today. But uh, uh, it was I talked to Tim McGuire about it. I said, what, 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 what was it? What, what, <laughs> what caused him to be, you know, the, the, the ultimate homer? And he thinks. He thought it was acceptance. He's yep. a ten-year-old kid from, you know, North Minneapolis with no money, selling yep. newspapers on the street corner, and uh, he wanted people to feel, you know, to to like to run into him. And now, now he didn't care about you and I and the negative geniuses. <laughs> By the way, I was saying earlier today, he's the only guy who used geniuses as a negative. <laughs> If you were called a genius, yeah. if you were called a genius, you might as well be called a, you know, whatever, whatever profanity you can think of. But it, it's amazing how he was still. He, I, I call him an insecure egomaniac. It's a, it was a, a kind of a contrast. I mean, it, it, he was he managed to remain insecure. Even as he became a one-word celebrity in right. his entire state and lauded everywhere he went, but it was—it's uh, amazing how he—he uh, he just, you know, as, you know, the the, the what everybody's going to say about Sid ten years ago is he had a column in the paper the day he died. That's what's That's exactly that. right. By the way, uh, McGuire's theory. Was the same as Chad's. He 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 told us an hour ago about that. Oh, you know the really? nine the nine year old and about. He even talked about you know he's, he's his father drank a lot was an alcoholic he, he he was not really very helpful he was very close to his mom as I'm sure you know but yes. he said the same thing it was that that nine year old kid doesn't finish high school the whole bit and that all that a lot of that insecurity was bred there no matter what came after and that that's what that he, he sort of. That became the thing he fed off of, or couldn't couldn't rise above. That sort of made him the way he was. So McGuire might have been onto something. Uh, well, the psychology. I want to give you a little psychology about about his insecurity. I write his book, right? Yes, nineteen ninety six. He, you know, I write his book, and uh, he's the only sports writer that needed somebody <laughs> to write his book. But you know, that's another story. Yes, but so like. Three days after it's published, and he's, he comes over to me and says, because he's, now he's getting people are reading the thing, and they're saying, well, why didn't you write about this? Why didn't you write about this? He says, we got to write another book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I honest to God, it wasn't even the first of the year yet. It was like a month. I said, Sid, we got a contract. We can't write another book. I said, I'm going to write a book when you're no longer with us. I'm going to call it the truth. <laughs> but... Uh, but, uh, how did, by the way, how did you get, uh, remind, refresh my memory about how you became Sid's official biographer? You no, know, he paid me to do it. He paid me to do it. He paid, he paid me to write it. And did you have any trepidation? Because you got to spend a lot of time with him. And my, my, from afar, my thought on Sid was he was probably a gold mine of stories, but he didn't always know what he had. And, and so what was that process? Like, was it fun? Was it painful? Okay. Was it aggravating? Here's what happened. I started off inter trying to interview him. Well, and to try to interview him chronologically and discovered that they had no chance of working because he would be 40 years ahead right. and back and all over. So basically what I ended up doing then is coming up with, well, 50 categories with sub clauses and questions on them and said, okay, take Get yourself a tape recorder, answer all these questions, and then I got a transcript of that, and then I went uh, back and re-interviewed re him. And uh, and uh, dollars per hour it was not one of my <laughs> great, uh, great uh, things ever. But uh, here's the, the highlight was uh, when he, I'd give him like two chapters at a time, and one day 
One day I give him the chapter that has his date of birth in, on there, and he scratches it out. It's scratched out when he gives it back to me. And, and I said, Seth, we got to have your date of birth in there. We're going to be charging people 25 bucks or something. And he says, they don't need to know when I was born. Just say I was born. Okay. I said, okay, Sid. Uh, you know, some of us thought you were chaps, so I hatched. So uh, that's okay, but unbelievable. Let me ask you about, you know, I can remember when I was still relatively new, I, I think it was when the Vikings made that playoff run in 87. And so based on what I had already picked up, so I'd been there about a year at this point, and I, the, the, what I picked up was that, you know, at least publicly, uh, Sid and you and Sid and Souchere were at major odds, you know, major, major oh, yeah. odds. So. I'm thinking there's almost like this open hatred, and then it turns out the day where it's it's that we're about to go to RF. This is RFK Stadium. That's how far back it goes, and we all happen to have it turns out hotel rooms on the same floor in Washington. I don't know where we were staying, and I hear a commotion out in the hallway, and it's Sid, and it's Souchere, and they're talking like they're good buddies and they're friendly, <laughs> and they're and, I'm, and I was all confused. I said, "Wait a minute." I thought yeah. Sushi Boy couldn't stand Sid. So can you explain the psychology of, on the one hand, because we all had kind of had it with Sid, hating him at times, being frustrated with him at times, and yet then still having these human moments with him. Well, Sooch uh, had a better reason to be bitter because Sidney basically got his column as a, <laughs> start as a Tribune sports columnist pulled. Right. Uh, you know, because of the whole Metrodome mess. But I guess Suits must have just said, you know, they they had some, when Suits was this neophyte, and he'd travel around with Sid, and, you know, they Sid would keep the door open to the other hotel room, so in case he was, had a crisis or something, and Suits would tell stories about having to go off and go across the hall and turn the shower off, because <laughs> he didn't know how to turn the shower off and stuff like that. And they, I guess he just, I, I think, Suits has a powerful bride, and she might have said, nah. just forget it and yeah. get along with it, but I don't know what it is. But hey, listen, I've, uh, I was thinking about this today, Dan. If there's anybody who should be grateful for Sid, it's you. How so? Because, because you ended up in this market because of, uh, because of Sid, because no matter <laughs> what Bozich tells you, <laughs> Sitting next to Sid for a half of a Gopher game is the reason he oh. called up. He called up his boss and said, "I want to come home." Yeah, he yeah. drove Bozich out. That's a great and point. He got you. Yes, I hadn't did. thought of it that way. You're right. I mean, I in fact, I got the call from Bozich myself. I was sitting in my uh, in my apartment in my condo in Dallas. It's a Saturday night. It's that night of that game. He yeah. went to his Sid and he basically said, "I can't stay." I'm going to show up at Arnie Robbins' door, his house, and he did Sunday morning and said, uh, I can't do it. You're right. And if he hadn't, <laughs> yeah, who knows? I'd, I'd probably still be molding in Dallas. I was uh, there, and he left at halftime. <laughs> he was supposed to do like a 15 inside bar or something. He just did, after a half of hearing Sid cheering and screaming and complaining about the officials uh he just left he do, you, left. So, do you have a theory on why he and bud seem to hit it off beyond just the professional part of it i mean i you wrote a lot about that you know that what's that all about uh well you know 1949 uh bud's on campus he's he gets sit and lets him use his car and lets him do all this other stuff but it's been known to take advantage of situations, but somehow it developed into a, you know, I think Bud's uh, wife, Pat, liked it a lot, and he'd always bring gifts and stuff like that. And uh, But but to have the world's great greatest outdoorsman be a good buddy of a guy who couldn't tell a goose from a squirrel is, is a phenomenal. Astonishing. Because... There couldn't have been two guys more different in the entire world, and I don't understand it. I, you know, there was certainly part of it was. I think initially it was Bud probably taking advantage of Sid trying to, you know, get information and whatever, be a buddy with that 
You know, there's a famous 1949 Gopher football team that Bud was on that was supposed to go to the Rose Bowl, hmm. and Sid was the beat guy, and uh, you know, and that that that's where the friendship started. But then, you know, Sid signed him for the Lakers or helped sign him for the Lakers, and uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, as mysterious as Sid is, there's a little mystery about Bud too. So I I I, I I don't think I can analyze it, but it's uh, phenomenal to me that this that these two opposite opposite human. I mean, one guy is the most common sense, uh, think everything out guy in the history of the mankind, yeah. and the other never had more than two straight hours of sleep in his life without <laughs> having to pop it up in bed and having some weird thoughts in his head. <laughs> You know, I yeah. mean, complete opposite, uh, but somehow it worked. That's I, a, I don't know how that works. It's the astonishing part about it. Uh, just a couple last things before we go. We're chatting with Patrick Royce on on Sid. Do you buy the notion there there are there are homers in other towns? Okay, but do you yeah. buy the notion that he set a template that was so overpowering that it may it did indeed make it harder. For guys like you and me who kind of want to push back and 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 want to needle and and want to occasionally even rip rather uh, vociferously, that it really made it harder than it otherwise would have been in other places. Did you do you think that it was that different this market because of him? I I do think in in my immaturity of younger age, it made me more determined to push back. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I I think. You know, there weren't, I gotta admit, I didn't write three straight columns when Indiana came to town praising the great program without mentioning Bobby Knight's name because of Bobby Knight. <laughs> because I wanted to agitate them. So, you know, I think that in my younger years, right. uh, that I did, uh, you know, that, that I pushed back harder. I think it certainly created a, uh, a, a situation in town where you you had a especially with Gopher fans you had this huge population that didn't want to hear the truth and that, that was probably yeah it might have been a little more difficult where uh, you know it's uh, to, to, to take a to take a shot you know uh, and and here's the other thing nothing that was this the Sydney never wrote a subtle sentence in his life right so any attempts at Subtle, you know, sackle, sarcasm, you know, sure. stuff like that, uh, fell flat with the Sid audience. So I, there's something to that. But, uh, I think it, I think it, in, in, in the end, it led to more negative <laughs> reporting than more positive reporting. Probably and right. You didn't want to be like Sid. Right. You didn't want to be put in that category. Uh, last item, who first called him? Was it you or somebody? How did he get the moniker, the great man? I think I started calling him that in print, but I don't know if it came from. Okay. I, I think I did probably call him that in print because you know, it, at least in uh, in the opinion of uh, in the opinion of a lot of people, including him, <laughs> he was a great man. <laughs> what I always loved best about it, I, I would have liked to seen Sid's eulogy to himself. That's what I yeah. would have liked to seen because every other eulogy he wrote ended up being a tribute. <laughs> That's very. That was our somehow, joke. Yes. Somehow he would twist them around to what what he did for that yeah. person, and it would be nice to see that might you, that, that would, would be. never that would never work. But it would be a nice satirical column to write. Sid Bain tribute to Sid would be pretty good, but I don't think we have an appetite. For no, that you're probably here. right about that. Well, you're, you're right. He, a lot of times it would even be the the, the the salute to himself for being the one guy who could get him on the phone. You know, the guy who died on the phone. So as opposed to any sort of, well, what do you remember about the guy himself? It was uh, it became kind of an open joke for us. Um, I uh, I the the work was exemplary, man. Today, you guys did a really really. <laughs> Yeah, I did yourself. And I know the old bit, you said a lot of it had been already written, but I, I know you added some stuff to it and you wrote some other stuff. And even the video stuff that you guys have is smart, man, because it's 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 almost time capsule uh, kinds of things. So uh, you guys did a really good job. You started, would, for sure. We had, 
Thank you a lot. We had one big screw up though. The tape recorder that they drew a picture of was the second version. We did the old one that you could have beat off buggers with. Oh no! You know that one, yeah, yeah. It was the different. It was a it was a more modern tape recorder. They should have had the picture to draw. They should have. Yeah, I didn't. E- I guess I didn't even. You know, Charles Hallman had tweeted me and mentioned something about that, and I didn't understand it. But I guess that's what it was. I didn't look yeah, at the uh, drawing that. closely enough. Because, I mean, the old one, guy Eddie and Herbeck and those guys used to get on it and yeah. leave these propane yeah. messages and stuff. <laughs> yeah. When he'd leave it around and he'd, you know, he'd be playing it and it would say, hey, sit, bleep, 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 and all this stuff. So, End of anyway, an era. We, Unbelievable. You know, we can say about everybody, we'll never see his like again. But in this case, 100% accurate. Thank you. I appreciate it as always, man. Be good. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks. That's Patrick Royce.